It is indeed time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of His Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Good morning. Good morning, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, yesterday the government House Leader uh, took all the Premier's questions, so I was going to try again to see if the Premier will actually address the disastrous situation he's landed his government in. Every month, people are struggling to make ends meet. People need a government that's going to help them, but instead they are seeing one mired in scandal. Speaker, the revelations from the government's $8 billion greenbelt grab are getting more and more serious every single day, and people deserve answers. Could the Premier confirm that his government is currently under criminal investigation by the RCMP? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, Government House Leader. Look, uh, as I, I said yesterday, uh, we uh, stand ready to assist uh, the RCMP as they undertake a review. At this point, we have not been contacted uh, uh, by the RCMP. Thank you. Supplementary question. Um, I want to remind this Premier and this government that uh, their Premier told voters that he was going to move away from cash for access politics, that he was going to end the cronyism that brought down the previous Liberal government. Well, the Premier broke that promise, and five years later, the Premier and his government are under criminal investigation by the RCMP. Speaker, to the Premier, how can the people of this province trust their government when it's under an active RCMP criminal investigation? Mr. Minister of and Housing. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker. Look, we will continue to do everything that we need to do in order to ensure that we build a bigger, better, stronger, safer province of Ontario. The Leader of the Opposition in her first question talked about affordability. Imagine the Leader of the Opposition, an NDP Leader of the Opposition, talking about affordability when she and her party have voted against every single measure that would put more money back in the pockets of the people of the province of Ontario. They actually voted against remember the lift tax credit for those colleagues who were here in the first in the in the last parliament. They will know that we introduced the lift tax credit which virtually eliminated uh, the lowest income earners from having to pay taxes to the province of Ontario. They voted against it, Mr. Speaker, because there's a fundamental difference Order. between them and us. They want people to rely on government and to be dependent on government. We want to give people the tools to succeed and Fonts. each and every day that is what we're doing working for the people of the province of Ontario to give them the tools to succeed and that's why 700,000 people have the dignity of a job Mr. Speaker order final supplementary speaker the people of this province deserve answers from the premier of this province When a government is embattled in this much scandal, it is bad for business, it is bad for the economy. What kind of precedent does it set if people think that succeeding in Ontario is about your connections rather than your merit? It is shameful. I made this point yesterday, and I want to remind the government again that the special unit at the RCMP that is investigating the Premier and his government's actions investigates elected officials on quoting them here, fraud financial crimes, corruption, breach of trust. So back to the Premier of this province. How can the Premier maintain the confidence of the people when his government is being investigated by the RCMP? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, you know what's bad for businesses? You know what's bad for the economy? You know what's bad for, for, the pro for taxpayers across Order. this province? What is bad are policies that are supported by Order. the NDP. When they had the chance with the Liberals in power for 15 years, they brought this province to its knees. Yesterday, yesterday, this minister, along with the Premier, announced another, I think it's an over $2 billion, $2 billion investment in the province of Ontario. You know who has confidence in the people of the province of Ontario? Investors Order. around the world who have given over $27 billion of investment to this economy, Mr. Speaker. You know who has confidence in this government? The over 700,000 people who have the dignity of a job that didn't when they and they were in power, Mr. Speaker. That is what we're doing. You know what the leader the opposition can do to help us on affordability, Order. she can call her leader in Ottawa and say, take the 14.3 cents a litre on gas off, help us remove the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker, to put even more money back in the pockets of the people of Ontario. Will they do it? No, Mr. Speaker, because they don't care about the people of the province of Ontario. Order. Order. The next question, leader of the opposition. Speaker, thank you. Um, 
instead of taking accountability, this government just lobs insults. They vote down accountability measures. They won't answer Order. simple questions Order. about their whereabouts and their actions. I'm going to get very specific here, uh, Speaker. On September 14, 2022, a senior staffer for this government received greenbelt removal packages from developers at a dinner. The next day, this staffer sought clarity directly from the Premier, his Chief of Staff, and the former Housing Minister. The Premier and his Chief of Staff claimed they don't recall this meeting. Oh. Will the Premier let us know what was discussed in that meeting with Ryan Amato on September 15, 2022? Mr. Minister of Affairs and Housing. The Integrity Commissioner said he said not only that the Premier had no knowledge, but more importantly that the actions of the government were guided on a desire and a belief that we could build more homes for the people of the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker. Now, as I said on a number of cases, we made a public policy decision that wasn't supported by the people of the Order. province of Ontario. Order. That is why I introduced legislation yesterday to reverse that, Mr. Speaker. But you know what's an insult to the people of the province of Ontario? Every time they go to the gas pump and they're paying an extra 14.3 cents a litre because of the end and the Liberals. When they go to the grocery store and they see that the price of vegetables is higher. Why? Because of the Liberals and the NDP and a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. When they open their gas bills Order. over the winter season and they see the price of car uh, the carbon tax on each of those bills, that's an insult to the people of the province of Ontario. So if the leader of the opposition really wants to respect the Response. people of the province of Ontario, she'll call her federal leader in Ottawa and say, work with us. Let's remove the carbon tax on the things that matter to the people of the province of Ontario. Let's make this company country more affordable because we can do it. Supplementary question. No one believes that. No, no one believes that. Order. No one believes that. The premier, Talk. The premier Talk about it. Order. I'll remind the members of the House that interjections are out of order, always out of order as a matter of fact. And I have to be able to hear the member who legitimately has the floor. And all of us should listen to each other. Listen to the member who has the floor. Start the clock. Leader of the opposition. So we have a thank you, Speaker. We have a premier who still won't come clean or answer that question. Over three days in September. This government went from a rough notion of a policy framework on the Greenbelt to specific properties being identified for removal. Day one, the build dinner where developers identified properties for removal from the Greenbelt. Day two, a meeting with the Premier and Housing Minister and their staff on the Greenbelt. Mysteriously, no one can recall the details of this meeting. Day three, the Ministry of Housing moves forward with site-specific removals and identified three properties. These properties accounted for 91 per cent of the land this government attempted to remove from the Greenbelt, and two of those properties were identified by developers at the build dinner. Question. Speaker, I'm going to ask again. What caused this government to make a policy 180 on the Greenbelt file from September 14th to September 16th? And so please take your seat. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, now, colleagues, the leader of the NDP said that she doesn't believe a carbon tax is costing the people of the province of Ontario anything. So I asked my colleagues, do you believe it's costing us more? Yes, Mr. Stop the clock. I'd, I'd really like to be a part of this, if, if possible. Order. Order. Uh, please start the clock. Minister and I appreciate Mr. Speaker, the importance of, the, uh, of eliminating a carbon tax, even in your community, where farmers are paying each and every day, whether it is to plant the fruit, to plant the seed and the crop in the ground, or to harvest the crop in the ground. I was speaking to Larry Simpson in my riding, a, a, a magnificent potato farmer who was talking about a great crop this sure. year, but the cost of taking those, that crop out of the ground and then delivering it across the province of Ontario is exorbitant. The cost of heating the potatoes over the winter to keep them 
in, uh, available for delivery, Mr. Speaker, is incredible, and it's because of the carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. So if the leader of the opposition Response. doesn't believe that it is costing the people of Canada enormously, Mr. Speaker, I ask her to call a few people who are struggling each and every day because of a carbon tax, Mr. Speaker. But we'll continue to work for all people and put more money back. Thank you. The final supplementary. Speaker, I understand that uh, the Premier and the government House Leader don't want to address the questions about the RCMP criminal investigation of their government. Um, I bet the RCMP won't accept that the Premier can't recall. I know that the people of Ontario, and I don't buy it. It's not just September 15th. There were a number of meetings between the Ministry of Municipal Affairs, the Premier's Office, the Cabinet Office, and the Premier's Chief of Staff. The Cabinet Office booked a meeting on September 7th. On September 21st, there was a meeting to discuss site-specific removals. An hour-long conversation between the Premier's Chief of Staff and Mr. Amato on September 23rd, and I could go on. Speaker, does the Premier really expect people to believe he had nothing to do with this? Minister of Mr. Affairs and Housing. This province and this caucus are concerned about is ensuring that life is more affordable for the people of the province of Ontario each and every day. Now, they can talk about it as much as they want. What they really are saying, and we all know it, Mr. Speaker, is that they want to put obstacles in the way of building more homes for the people of the province of Ontario because they were so effective at doing it with the Liberals, right? They were so effective at putting obstacles in the way they put Ontario into a housing crisis and we have every single year that we have been in office mr speaker we have put measures on the on the on the floor of this uh, legislature to remove those obstacles and they have voted against it but we will not stop mr speaker we'll continue to make make life more affordable for the people of the Ontario. we'll continue to fight against carbon Order. Tax. we'll continue to build infrastructure we'll continue to build long term care we'll continue to build roads so that we can get our product to market faster and we will Response. continue to see massive investments like the t over 27 billion dollars that have come to Ontario that has created over 700,000 jobs, Mr. Speaker. That is what we'll continue to do, Mr. Speaker, each and every Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Um, every day I rise in this House with facts and dates and details on scandals that span ministries and Order. ministers and MPPs and staff, and every day the government House Leader goes on a long-winded rant completely unrelated to the questions that we're asking. Order. Two senior members of the Premier's staff Order. and a minister of his went down to Vegas with a greenbelt speculator and may have, quote, misled the integrity commissioner about it. Will the Premier use the ability his cabinet has to ask for a full inquiry from the integrity commissioner into the Vegas affair? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. I think that really clarifies everything, right? So for the Leader of the Opposition, over $27 billion of investment in Ontario is a rant. To the Leader of the Opposition, <laughs> fighting a carbon tax is a rant. To the Leader of the Opposition, putting more money back in your pocket is a rant. So I guess the thousands, the millions of Canadians from coast to coast to coast are ranting when they say that life has become less affordable because of the policies of the Liberals and the NDP, Mr. Speaker. I tell you what we have here. We have the Mayor Brantford here. You know what he's excited about? He's excited about a brand new long term care home, the groundbreaking, Mr. Speaker, of a brand new long term care home in his, uh, in his riding. That's what he's excited about. He's excited about the jobs and opportunity that come with that investment. You know who never brought that investment? It was the Liberals and the NDP, because in their time, they brought what, 611? There are more beds, long term care beds, being Once. built in that community in Brantford than there were in the entire province of Ontario when they had the opportunity. That's what people are excited about. It's not a rant, it's fact, and that's what the people of Ontario care about. Stop the clock. Order. Order. The House will come to order. The House will come to order so we can resume question period. Start the clock. The supplementary question. Speaker, it should be really actually quite easy to answer these questions. Uh, this boys' trip to Vegas 
with its massage tables and its good luck rituals and its mannies and its petties made international headlines. How embarrassing. This government wasted no time asking the Integrity Commissioner to look into the actions of a staff member, Mr. Amato. They promised that they would look to the Integrity Commissioner to investigate the actions of someone else who was on that trip, the member for Mississauga East Cooksville, a former Conservative minister, but they don't seem to have taken any action. So, Speaker, back to the Premier. Is his government dragging its heels because the Premier himself has something to hide? Minister Municipal Affairs and Housing. Position. Like, this is unbelievable, dragging our heels. We started in 2018. The very first measures that we took in this place were to build jobs and opportunity for the people of the province of Ontario. It is they who have been dragging their heels, voting against every single measure that would grow the economy, Mr. Speaker. They dragged their heels when it came to investing in hospitals, building new hospitals, refurbishing some of the old hospitals. They have dragged their heels and continue to drag their heels when we talk about building the 413. They're absolutely dead set against people bringing their product to market. They have voted against the investments that we're making to bring back our auto sector. They have voted against the expansion of our colleges and universities. They've voted against the changes that we're making to our education curriculum and are finally seeing results for our students who stagnated over 15 years of policies of the Liberal and NDP. So when she talks about dragging your heels, Mr. Speaker, the only people that are dragging their heels are the Liberals and NDP, a coalition of the doomed that saw this province brought to its knees, Mr. Speaker. We're rebuilding this province and we'll continue to do it in 700 Order. Order. The House will come to order. Order. The member is waiting to ask a question. Okay, let's start the clock. The member for Hastings, Lennox, and Addington. Okay. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation, and Trade. Speaker, the previous Liberal government left Ontario fully unprepared for the electric vehicle future. They allowed thousands of auto manufacturing jobs to leave this province and watched on as the electric vehicle supply chain was being built somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Thankfully, our government realized, recognized that our province has everything we need right here to build a resilient end-to-end -end EV supply chain right here in Ontario. Mm -hmm. That's why we've seen more than $26 billion in auto and EV-related investments in just the last three years, including a huge investment we welcomed from Umacore just yesterday in Loyalist Township, my home. Yeah. Okay. Speaker, can the minister please discuss Umacore's recent investment and what this will mean for the people of Loyalist Township, Lennox and Huntington County, and all of Ontario? The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Speaker, we were in the members' riding yesterday along with Premier Ford where we uh, turned the sod at an historic $2.8 billion plant. <laughs> Umicor, the company Umicor will make battery uh, cathode components. This is an expansion of their previously announced $1.5 billion facility. But, uh, but, Speaker, we're not just building a plant, we are building Ontario's future. They are hiring 1,000 workers for two years to build the facility. This will be one of the largest employers in all of uh, Eastern Ontario. They will have 600 sought-after, good-paying career jobs. They will hire 700 Bonds. apprentices, uh, co student co-ops. This is the first type of this EV battery supplier in all of North America. Welcome, Umicore. The supplementary question. 
Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for the answer. Umacore's investment is just fabulous news for the auto sector and for the hardworking people of Loyalist Township and all of Eastern Ontario. Our government recognizes the massive economic benefits that will stem from Ontario being a global leader in electric vehicle production. And that's why we've been laser focused on securing generational investments like the one from Umacore. Speaker, will the minister please elaborate on what Umacore investment means to our end to end EV supply chain? Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade. Well, just think about where we were five years ago. We had an auto sector that was failing, no plans for EV production, but under the leadership of Premier Ford, we have a plan. It's called Driving Prosperity, and it was the plan to make Ontario the EV global centre. We started with all the current automakers, success. We then attracted two major battery manufacturers, success. And now, after $27 billion of investment, we're working on all of the major supply chain. Umicore is the first, the first of many component suppliers for our EV revolution. Think of this, Speaker. We went from zero to $27 billion in three years. That's why Pause. Bloomberg names us names Ontario as the number two in the global EV supply chain. We are building things here in the province of Ontario and the leading speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member from London West. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. Speaker, in late August, the Premier appointed Sajid Hussain to the Species at Risk Program Advisory Committee. Mr. Hussain is a developer with no apparent credentials with respect to species at risk. He has also been accused of unlawfully misappropriating millions of dollars from his company for his own personal use. Speaker, why did the Premier Premier appoint Mr. Hussain to this government committee when he knew or should have known about these disturbing allegations. And to apply the Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Thank you, Speaker. I want to make one thing clear. Our government holds appointments to the highest regard. This is why this individual in question, this individual in question is no longer an appointee of the government. Unfortunately, we cannot Order. say the same about the opposition. And uh, the standards that this leader of the opposition holds is caucus to, following the disturbing comments a certain member of the opposition made this previous week regarding Order. the situation and the massacre in Israel. However, Speaker, while the opposition continues to coddle this individual, our government is doing the real work, and we are defending Ontario's biodiversity, building Ontario's climate resiliency, and protecting species at risk. Here, here. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Again to the Premier. While Sajid Hussein appears to have had no qualifications or expertise around species at risk, he is certainly an expert when it comes to making donations to the PC party. Mr. Hussein has donated over $15,000 to the PC party since 2019. Order. Speaker, was Mr. Hussein's donor record the reason for the Premier's willingness to overlook the very serious allegations against Mr. Hussein? Mr. Environment, Conservation, Parks. Uh, thank you, and uh, I, I, you know, I, I want to mention, you know, if you have a leader of the opposition whose caucus laughs at massacres that happened in Israel, Speaker, totally unacceptable, and definitely shows no leadership. But Speaker, when we talk about leadership, we are empowering conservationists, empowering ecologists, we're empowering biologists not politicians, to make large-scale strategic investments in protecting species Order. at risk here in Ontario. We are making direct investments in protecting species at risk and the Species at Risk Stewardship Program. For instance, Speaker, we've engaged over 14,000 volunteers in conservation efforts and created 1,700 jobs. Speaker, This is how our government is building Ontario and protecting species at risk. Speaker. And we've restored over 42,000 acres of habitat for species at risk, Spons. equal to nearly 100,000 hockey rinks. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Mississauga, Aaron Mills. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Associate Minister of Small Businesses. As Small Business Week get underway, thousands of small businesses across Ontario, including the ones in my riding of Mississauga Air Mills, are looking for ways to sustain and grow their businesses. Small businesses are the economic backbone of communities across our province. However, starting and growing a business is a hard work. Business owners and entrepreneurs need real support and resources that will help them to be innovative and to expand their businesses. That's why our government must continue to help small businesses so they can provide jobs to people from their communities. When small businesses grow and thrive, Mr. Speaker, all of Ontario succeed. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is supporting small businesses across Ontario? The Associate Minister. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I really want to thank the member from Mississauga, Erin Mills, for the question. This Small Business Week, we celebrate the ambition and entrepreneurial spirit of small business owners and their businesses right across our province. Mr. Speaker, as a former small business owner, I know firsthand the risks and hard work it takes to start and grow a business. Ontario's more than 435,000 small businesses are the backbone of our communities, employing more than 2.4 million people. These small businesses exist in towns and cities across our province. And, Mr. Speaker, for 2022-23 and 2023-24, we are investing an additional $40 million in the Digital Main Street program, which brings our total investment to over $57 million. To date, Mr. Speaker, Response. Digital Main Street has helped more than 69,000 small businesses create and increase their digital presence. These are real, tangible resources, Mr. Speaker, and small businesses. Thank you very much. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Associate Minister is right in saying that small businesses are critical in building a stronger Ontario. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, gave up on small businesses, resulting in hundreds of thousands of jobs leaving our province. Countless opportunities were lost due to the previous Liberal government agenda of high taxes and red tape. Fortunately, our government is determined to create the right conditions for new businesses to start up and succeed in our province. That's why our government must remain committed to making investments that will help provide business owners with the resources they need. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please explain how our government is supporting the development of new businesses in Ontario? The Associate Minister of Small Business. Thank you again for the question. Our government understands that small businesses are vital to our economic success and essential to regional communities right across our province. Small businesses make up almost 98% of all businesses in Ontario. From family-owned corner stores to brand new startups, everyone knows a small business that has made a difference in their community. And we know we need to create the environment for more of these businesses to launch and succeed. So far, Mr. Speaker, we've provided $3 million to Futurepreneur Canada, and in 2023-24, the government's providing an additional $2 million, bringing our total investment to over $5 million. These investments are critical to our economic success. Now, thousands of young, small business owners between the ages of 18 and 39 will be able to access mentorship programs and Us. financial resources. We will always support and promote our world-class small business sector. To all of Ontario's small businesses, happy Small Business Week, and thank you for all that you do to support us all. Thank you. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Falls. Thank you. My question is to the Premier. On June 9th, this government gave three ministers zoning orders to Southbridge Care, a for-profit long-term care facility owned by a real estate investment firm, Yorkville Asset Management. None of these MCOs had been requested by the local municipality. One of the MCO was for Orchard Villa in Pickering, where 78 seniors died during COVID-19 pandemic, and the military had to be called in to take over. The executives 
and lobbyists for this particular operator have strong donor and political ties to the Conservative Party. My question is, did the minister give preferential treatment to Southbridge? Mr. Mr. Affairs and Housing. You know what I did, Mr. Speaker, when I was the Minister of Long-Term Care, and that I would do as Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing, I gave preferential treatment to tear down a home that should have been torn down ages ago, but the Liberals and the NDP refused to do it. What we want to do in Pickering is tear down an old, outdated home that still has ward rooms in it, Mr. Speaker, and build a brand new long-term care home. That's what we're doing in, in, uh, in, uh, in Pickering. It's the same MZO that I wanted to do in, uh, in, uh, in Port Hope, Mr. Speaker. Tear down two old homes that aren't even sprinklered, Mr. Speaker, and replace it with brand new long-term care homes. And here you have it, on the floor of the Legislative Assembly of Ontario, the people of Ontario can see quite clearly they don't even want to build brand new long-term care homes for the people of the province of Ontario. They vote Response. against literally everything. So will I stop doing MZOs to build new long-term care homes? No. In fact, I'll go just in the opposite direction. If I can do it better and faster, I will. Order. The supplementary question. I'm not sure I'd be proud of being the minister when 6,000 of our seniors died in long-term care homes over COVID. And I'm going to tell you, I'm, Order. Order. I'm going to tell you what happened. After taking over from Southbridge Orchard Villa, the military reported that residents had been choking from improper feeding, the presence of cockroaches and rotting food, dehydration, and patients were left in spoiled diapers. The Premier Order. said, the Premier said, not Wayne Gates, the Premier said, it was the worst report, the most heart-wrenching report I have ever read in my entire life, ever, end quote. But this government Order. rewarded Southbridge with three minister zoning orders in one day, including Orchard Villa. Question. Shame. Why did the Premier and Minister give preferential treatment to Southbridge care homes when our seniors were dying and being treated with disrespect every single day in that home? Thank you very much. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Order. We gave MZOs, Mr. Speaker, because we wanted to build brand new long term care homes, and we're going to continue to build brand new long term care homes, and I won't let obstacles stand in the way. Order. So when this Minister of Long Term, long -term Care comes to me and says, I want to tear down an old Order. home and replace it with a brand new one, I will say yes, Mr. Speaker. This is the very same party that held the balance of power for four years in this place, and did they make investments in long term care? No. If you want blood, on your hands, look in the mirror. You have the option to do something. I'm going to caution the members on the use of language, whether it is in their questions or their responses. I think it's important that we maintain a high standard of decorum. People of Ontario would expect that. Order. Order. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing will come to order. The member for Niagara Falls will come to order. Start the clock. The next question. The member for Car Canada, Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To quote Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. The Auditor General and the Integrity Commissioner identified irregularities in the way the Greenbelt lands were awarded to developers. Proper processes and regulations were not followed. Public information was restricted, and bid fairness protocols were ignored. When they favored their wealthy insider friends and donors, and now, the RCMP has launched a criminal investigation into this $8.2 billion Greenbelt scandal. Now we learn that the government has signed a 95-year lease 
to allow the building of a luxury, exclusive European spa on Ontario Place lands by wealthy, connected insiders, Question. with no evidence of due diligence. My question to the Premier is, with all the similarities between the Greenbelt and the Ontario Place projects, how can the people of Ontario believe that this isn't the exact same game? Minister of Infrastructure to reply. Mr. Speaker, I'm actually very pleased to take this specific question, and I would like to reference an article from July 2018 in the Globe and Mail written by Jeff Gray. The previous Ontario government was in the final stages of selecting a private sector bidder to redevelop Ontario Place when it was forced to put the negotiations on hold. Sources said the top three submissions included one from Therme, a German spa and water pro company which would have included a new beach. Thank you for asking me this question. Order. Order. Supplementary question. Member for Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are times when the opposition talks about the government talks about roadblocks and obstacles and things that are in the way. We call those laws, Mr. Speaker. And again, my question remains the same. How can the people of Ontario have confidence that the same thing that happened with the Green Belt lands is not happening once again with Ontario Place? Minister of Infrastructure. Mr. Speaker, we're talking about two separate government procurements, uh, two, uh, led by two separate governments, two separate evaluation criteria, and Therme. Uh, was was one of the awarding proponents for the redevelopment of Ontario Place through an arm's length agency called Infrastructure Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we will do something that they were not capable of doing, and that is bring Ontario Place back to life and make it a place that everyone can enjoy 365 days of the year. Thank you. The next question. The member for Richmond Hill. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. As a mother of four, I know that a balanced diet and proper nutrition are important for our children. It is important for their development. Good nutritious food helps our children's mental and physical health and is a foundation of academic success. That is why it is unacceptable to hear some children in Ontario will go to school hungry. Our government must show leadership and do all that we can to set up Ontario's next generation for success by ensuring that they have access to nutritious meals and snacks during the school day. Speaker. Can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to promote Question. healthy food access and children across Ontario? Children, community and social services. Thank you very much, Speaker, and I want to thank my uh, colleague from Richmond Hill for the great question and all the great work that she does in, in her writing. <laughs> Speaker, our government invests in the Student Nutrition Program and the First Nations Student Nutrition Program. They've been instrumental in ensuring that students across Ontario have access to healthy and nutritious meals. Earlier this year, Mr. Speaker, our government invested an additional $1.1 million into these programs. And just the other week, alongside the Minister of Education, we announced an additional investment of $5 million in funding, bringing the total provincial funding to $38 million this year, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, these investments will help us deliver almost 90 million nutritious meals and snacks to students, ensuring that they have the energy and focus they need to excel in their education. Response? Speaker, we'll continue to deliver these vital services to students who depend on it. Because, Mr. Speaker, I've said it many times, and I'll say it again: students may be a portion of our population. They're 100 percent. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to my great minister. These additional investments made by our government will help to expand access to nutritious food for students across our province. However, the reality is that there are children in our communities, including those in my riding of Richmond Hill, who are at risk of going to school hungry every day. 
Access to nutritious food helps students to be more alert and ready to learn and helps to improve the overall physical health and well-being. Our government's investments will go a long way in helping to provide students with nutritious food at school. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is working with all levels of government, community agencies and partners in support the student nutrition program? Question. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. I thank my uh, colleague for the follow-up. Mr. Speaker, our government believes that no student should go to school hungry, and that's why we've partnered with organizations including the RL Family Foundation, the Breakfast Club of Canada, the Shad Foundation, and the Grocery Foundation to improve these programs. Speaker, the $1.67 million already raised by partners alongside our government's $5 million investment shows how the public and private entities can come together to make a meaningful impact on the lives of Ontario students. And I'm grateful for the generous support and encourage all Ontarians to get involved and support the success of our students. And Mr. Speaker, together we can provide a strong foundation for their academic achievements and overall well-being in the province because again, Mr. Speaker, the 100 percent of our future and we need to continue to invest Thank in you. that. Thank you. The next question, the member for Thunder Bay Superior North. Mr. Speaker, last week the Auditor General's office confirmed they are investigating ministers' zoning orders. MZOs create a two-tier planning system where favoured developers can skip the planning rules that apply to everyone else. A couple of years ago, in this House, the member for Waterloo asked the Premier about a large number of MZOs that went to his friend Shakir Ramatula, who has received more MZOs than any other landowner. The Integrity Commissioner is now investigating whether MZOs are being improperly issued to favoured developers overruling responsible municipal planning. Will the Premier stop overruling critical wetland and farmland protections to benefit his friends? Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, what we will continue to do is provide MZOs when it helps move the province of Ontario forward. Now, MZOs for long-term care, MZOs to build hospitals, MZOs to build uh, supportive housing in the city of Toronto, Mr. Speaker. No. Will I stop uh, issuing MZOs when it supports the priorities of the province of Ontario, when it helps people in the province of Ontario, when it helps job creation, when it gives people their first home, Mr. Speaker? No, I won't stop doing that. Will I continue to issue MZOs when it means an old long-term care home can be torn down and replaced by a brand new one? No, Mr. Speaker. I'll continue to do that. They want to stand in the way of all of that. I won't, Mr. Speaker. In fact, some of their own members have asked me for MZOs in their own ridings so that we can get long-term care homes, so that we can get uh, uh, socialized housing in their homes. So uh, I say to the member very clearly, for the Fox. caucus members around you, I will continue to issue it when it is in the best interest of the people of the province of Ontario. Incredibly, this Premier has issued more MZOs benefiting just the guests at his daughter's wedding reception than the previous government issued in total during its 15 years in power. Interesting. Without building a single new home or business, an MZO increases the value of a property instantly by generating enormous speculative profits for the owner. The NDP looked at every MZO this government has issued, more than 100, and in most cases, we were able to find a personal, political or donor tie to the Premier or the PC party. Shame. Does the Premier finally understand why Ontarians have lost trust in this government? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, Mr. Speaker, let's, let's put it into context. Uh, MZOs have created over 5,600 long-term care beds across the province of Ontario. MZOs have supported the building of over 117,000 socialized housing units across the province of Ontario. MZOs have helped us build brand new hospitals in the province of Ontario. MZOs have helped us build 
create uh, the conditions for over 152,000 new jobs in the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. What you're hearing from the opposition is continued frustration that what we are doing is using the tools that we have to help build a stronger economy, to help restore confidence in industries that had lost it. Look, this is a this is a party that worked with the Liberals to drive out manufacturing. They lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. The, the Liberals of the NDP said that we should transition Fox. our economy to a service economy. What we're doing is building a better, stronger Ontario, $27 billion of an investment. Over 700,000 people have a dignity of a job, and I'll do whatever I can along with this caucus to support that, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. The Espanola Domtar Mill is set to idle its operation starting next month for an indefinite period of time. The impending stoppage has caused a lot of concern and frustration for people across the town of Espanola, Manitoulin, and the North Shore area. Arrangements have been made to help employees with the transition and to safely idle the mill's operation. However, there are still many unanswered questions about the fibre that has been unused and left at roadside. To the minister, what is the government's plan to ensure that this fibre does not simply rot and go to waste? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you very much, Speaker. You know, Speaker, when we heard that the Dom Tar Mill was idling, we took action right away, reaching out to community officials and having conversations with them about how this could affect them, reaching out to uh, at the, the company to say, how can we keep this conversation going and what can we do to facilitate the uh, re-energization of this mill in the future. Mr. Speaker, we remain very concerned about the businesses that are attached to this mill, not just the 450 jobs at the mill, but the secondary and tertiary companies that supply the mill and the forestry sector all throughout Ontario. Mr. Speaker, we have taken action when we heard this news. We will continue to work with all parties involved to make sure we get the very, very best outcome, not only for Espanola, but for the entire forestry sector. And we will continue continue to work with all of these parties as closely as, as we can every single day. We have a fantastic forestry sector here in Ontario, and we are extremely Once. proud of it. We'll continue to make sure that that forestry sector remains strong. The supplementary question. Again, to the Minister, Speaker, the operations of the North Shore Forest, such as uh, some of these contractors, RJ Whalen Logging, Darcy Alberta, H&R Fabri Industry Limited, Marvin Ritchie Trucking Limited, Ranger Logging Limited, Regin Sear Logging Limited, and that's just to name a few, who cut the fibre deserve to know what, when they will get paid for the work they've already done. Stopping operations at the mill will be disruptive enough as without adding the extra burden of watching harvested timber rot at roadside and worrying about the hundreds of potential job losses. Forestry is vital in the Algoma area, and this minister needs to show leadership during this difficult time. Minister, who will pick up the bill for the unused fibre, and how will these forestry companies become compensated for work Question. that has already been done? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you again, uh, Speaker, and uh, thank you for the question. Uh, as I said in the original answer, we continue to work with all sectors of our forestry partners that are affected by the closure of this mill, and that includes the uh, operators that uh, the member has spoken about. You know, we continue to make investments in the forestry sector. Our $20 million biomass forestry biomass program an unprecedented investment to drive the sector forward. Our forest uh, investment and innovation program, $10 million, again, to drive the industry forward. We want a strong industry so all the players in the industry have a chance to succeed, and we continue to make those investments. We continue to work with everyone involved. Last week, I actually joined the member on a call with uh, members from Espanola uh, and, the, and the community there to talk about uh, what we can do to assist. So we're there. We're helping we're Response. making sure the forestry sector in Ontario continues to succeed. The next question, the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. 
My question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Oh, he's on the hot seat. The Minister recently provided an update on the measures that our government is implementing to strengthen our wildland fire preparedness levels. This year, Ontario and Canada experienced one of the most challenging fire seasons in recent memory. That is why our government must not lose focus on the importance of keeping people and property safe. The people of Ontario are counting on our government to dedicate the resources that are necessary to ensure Ontario's fire rangers and communities are safe. Speaker, can the minister please explain what actions our government is taking to improve and modernize how we fight wildland fires? Natural resources and forestry. Well, thank you, Speaker. And uh, as I was in the north last week talking with forestry companies about the previous question, I was also there to make a very important announcement, an announcement of $20.5 million further investment in helping us fight wildland fires in Ontario, uh, an investment that looks to the future. Mr. Speaker, and recognizes that we may have some challenging fire seasons ahead of us, so we need more technology, uh, aerial drones that can help us with detection and suppression, supporting retention, attraction and retention of uh, forest firefighters, uh, also making sure that they have a good mental health uh, program uh, attached to that position. Mr. Speaker, we continue to make investments to ensure that communities, people, and infrastructure in Ontario remains safe. And again, $20.5 million will help advance that. Response. And this is in addition, Mr. Speaker, to the over 90% increase that we've uh, included in base budgeting since we took office in 2018. We are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Back to the member for Burlington. Thank you, Speaker. At a time when the number of wildfires is rising, it is also important that our government focuses on strategies that support forest sustainability. Ontario's forestry sec sector is of vital importance to the economic prosperity for people and communities across Ontario. Our province has a strong record of responsible forest management, but more must be done to support the forestry sector in reaching its full potential. Our government must continue to explore long-term strategies that will help to deliver economic benefits to all Ontarians. At the same time, our actions must help to sustain the forestry sector, reduce emissions, and support the environment. Speaker, can the minister please explain how our government is strengthening Ontario's forestry sector? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you again, Mr. Speaker, and, and it's time to put on the party hats. It's the fifth anniversary of the forest sector strategy. So, uh, happy fifth anniversary forest sector strategy. It's doing great things here in Ontario to drive this sector forward. Uh, and just a few highlights from it. It's amended Ontario's building code to allow the increased use of wood in mid-rise buildings. Delivered over $60 million in forestry resource revenues to 40 First Nations and Métis communities and collaborated with Forest Ontario and the Ontario Forest Industries Association to promote career pathways in the forestry industry. And also, Speaker, as I mentioned, the $20 million, the historic $20 million investment in the forest biomass program and the streams within it. We had an application process open until the end of September. It's all full up, Mr. Speaker, because Response. innovation in the forestry sector is here in Ontario. We are driving the sector forward, and it will prosper here in this province. Sure. <laughs> next question, the member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the current Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Speaker, it has been five years and four ministers, and this government has still only managed to have the same number of children enrolled to receive needs-based core autism services before they changed the program five years ago. Five years ago, there was 23,000 families waiting for these services. Now there are over 60,000. That's more than will fit into Rogers Stadium, Speaker. How is this better? Can the minister please tell us where the progress is? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I thank my uh, colleague for the question. I'd be more than happy to tell her why. I've done it many times, and I'll do it again, because the program wasn't working for the people of this province, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, 25% of, of the children and youth who were on the registry were receiving services before. Today, over 40,000 of families are receiving support and services. 
That's why she supported that party, Mr. Speaker, supported a, a failed program under the previous government. The families told them that. We started from scratch. We worked with those with lived experience, experts, clinicians, to put a program that was put together by the community for the community, yeah. Mr. Speaker. We went more than that. We doubled the funding to $600 million. And Mr. Speaker, we didn't stop there. This year, I announced that Response. we further increased the funding of the Ontario Autism Program by an additional 10 percent because, Mr. Speaker, we're doing what they couldn't do, they couldn't do here, for the here. people of this province. Speaker, hundreds of autism families have not travelled across the province or been protesting on the front lawn for the past two days because they're happy with the progress of this minister. The last minister, the minister before that, or the minister before that. No, they're here because they are desperate. They want and need answers. But more importantly, they want publicly funded, needs-based core therapy for their children before it's too late to make any difference in their children's lives. According to the reports based on a Freedom of Information, the minister's own transition binder says, quote, most children and youth will not receive core clinical services funding in the short to medium term, end quote. So what does this minister have to say to the families who are here, who are left struggling without this province? And please, for the love of children, not the same old talking points that Question. we've been listening to for the last five years. Members, will please take those seats. Mr. Children and Community and Social Services. Can you? Speaker, and again, I thank my uh, colleague for the question. I'd be more than happy to answer that. Again, Mr. Speaker, what we're doing is, is we've developed a program that was put together by the community for the community. The programs that she won't list, Mr. Speaker, I will do for her. These are programs that families across the province are accessing every day as soon as they register on Access OIP. Foundational Family Services, Caregiver Me Early Years Program, Entry to School Program, Urgent Response response services and mr speaker before they had access to one service today they have Order. multiple streams that they can access to every single family and as soon as they register for access Order. ontario now once again mr speaker the opposition always they'll come in here and they'll talk to you about with their questions to represent but mr speaker they held the balance of power you've been here longer than any one of us you know the process in parliament response. they could have held the previous government to account and say we will no longer support you if you do not double the ontario autism program but they failed the people of this province we're not going to stop the clock stop the clock Order. 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 Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order, and the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services will come to order. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Thornhill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Transportation. Toronto's population is growing rapidly, and as, as our city grows, transportation infrastructure also needs to expand. People need more convenient ways to connect to their jobs and family and other communities in the GTA. Unfortunately, the previous Liberal government, supported by the NDP, failed to plan ahead for the transit needs of our communities. They left people on crowded subways and buses and stuck in traffic. That is why our government must continue to implement solutions that will improve transportation options for the people of the GTA and beyond. Speaker, can the minister please provide us on, with an update on how our government is addressing the needs for more public transit? The Minister of Transportation. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The member from Thornhill is absolutely correct. The previous Liberal government refused to find solutions to the gridlock or build any public transit. They sat by and did nothing. But thanks to the advocacy a member uh, from Thornhill and other members in, in Toronto, we're not going to stick to the status quo. That's why we're building uh, long overdue projects uh, like the Ontario Line. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Line will take 400,000 people off the road every single day. 
Uh, the Ontario line will reduce crowding on the TTC and some of the busiest uh, stations and keep people moving across this province. Unlike the previous Liberal government in the 15 years, we're going to continue to invest in infrastructure that we need to keep people moving in this province. <laughs> Thank you, Speaker, and I want to congratulate him on his leadership. So, speaking of leadership, under the leadership of pre uh, the Premier and this minister, our government is making historic investments that sends a clear message that public transit infrastructure is a priority. The investments we're making today will have a lasting impact on future generations. However, the need for new public transit is urgent, and calls for greater action and investments are growing. The Toronto Regional uh, Board of Trade recently stated, and I quote, as the fastest growing metropolitan region in North America, the Toronto region urgently needs an expanded transportation network. Speaker, can the minister please provide an update on that progress of the Ontario line and what steps our government is taking for, to build a better transit faster? Your transportation. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We continue to make very strong progress on our priority subway plans. Uh, just recently, I joined the Premier and the Minister of Infrastructure um, as we visited the future Ontario line at Exhibition Place. Shovels are in the ground on early works, and, uh, Mr. Speaker, the full procurement of Ontario line uh, is nearly complete. Uh, this is a testimony to the unprecedented speed at which we are delivering this project. And Mr. Speaker, that wasn't by chance. Through the Building Tran uh, Transit Fast Track, we cut uh, delays and unnecessary red tape. However, Mr. Speaker, the members opposite, uh, both the opposition and uh, the, the Liberal Party, refused to support any measure to build transit faster. They voted against a $70 billion investment to increase public transit investment in this province. Response. They refused to vote for the Building Transit Faster Act in this province. Mr. Speaker, we are going to continue to focus our efforts on building Ontario and keeping this province moving. Thank you. The next question, the member for London, Bansom. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Education, and today is Ch Early Childhood Educator Appreciation Day, and the, the, the stakeholders and the ECEs are here today, and, but I've not been hearing that they're actually feeling valued. So for over a year, we've been raising alarm bells that the workforce crisis threatens childcare in this province. Early childhood educators are leaving the field faster than they can be trained. Back in January, the ministry held consultations on a childcare workforce strategy, yet the sector is still waiting for the province's plan. Meanwhile, local childcare programs are forced to close rooms and limit enrollment at a time when more parents are hoping to gain access to affordable childcare spaces. Speaker, when will this government release their report and actually act on the recommendations in that report? The Minister of Education. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member opposite for the question. I first off want to express gratitude to the ECs of this province for working hard, yeah. giving back, and really committing themselves to our youngest learners. I mean, during the pandemic, when our when so much closed, our child care centers stayed open. We are grateful for them every day. Now, Mr. Speaker, our government's commitment was to reduce fees, increase spaces, and lift wages, and we are doing each and every one. In fact, Mr. Speaker. When we started in 2018, when Liberals and New Democrats coalesced and fees increased by 400 per cent, making the false choice for so many families of their child being in care or a parent, particularly women, working in the economy, we've ended that by cutting childcare fees by 50 per cent, saving eight to $12,000 for every single child in this province. And Mr. Speaker, with respect to the workforce whom we value, we've increased wages by $1 per hour each year for the agreement that we signed with the federal government, and we'll continue to go further to ensure we lift wages, retain these workers, and create good value for them within our child care sector. And the supplementary question. Speaker, the minister knows what the problem is. ECE workers knows what the problem is. The Ontario Coalition for Better Child Care, the Association of Early Childhood Educators, Experts and Workers have told the government that a $10 a day child care program is under threat because of low pay and poor working conditions, with the average ECE in the field for just three years. 
The minister's own summaries on the consultation showed the government was overwhelmingly very told by variations to increase ECE pay. Ontario is one of the four provinces that still has not introduced a salary scale or a wage grid as part of the Canada Early Wild Wild Early Years. Sorry, Canada Wild. It is a wild season, but it's Canada Wild wide early years and child care plan, and the wage floor is the lowest in the country. The minister promised ECEs a wage increase in June. The months later, no word. Will the minister commit today to a salary scale of at least $30 per hour for our ECEs, $25 for non-ECEs, to get the program back on track and to get the par parents the affordable child care spots they need and deserve so parents can get back to work? Thank you. And the minister may reply. Mr. Speaker, let's not forget when New Democrats had the chance to vote for our budget, which cut fees by 50 percent, you voted against it. When you had the chance to support 86,000 additional spaces, given the long wait lists that were created under the former government, you opposed it. When we created a $213 million startup grant to incent the sector to create spaces in underrepresented communities, you voted against it. When we increased wages by a dollar per hour every single year, you voted against that. You have no you are in no position to lecture any government. You enabled a 400 per cent increase in child care fees, the most expensive in the Federation. This Premier, this government is committed to cutting fees, increasing Order. wages, and increasing spaces, and we will take no Order. lessons from the NDP. That concludes our question period this morning, but I will remind members once again to please make their comments through the chair. Pursuant to Standing Order 36A, the member for Hamilton Mountain has given notice of her dissatisfaction with the answer to her question given by the Minister of Children, Community and Social Services concerning autism services, and this matter will be debated today following private members' public business. There being no further business this morning, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.